okay. So, all right, and then it's transcribing. All right, awesome. So basically, I'm gonna intro us in and introduce you and I'll get us rolling. All right, and that'll be in five, four, Hey everybody, Eric here for Biz Talk, and um, once again, uh, I've got like superstar people uh, I'm interviewing, and uh, I have today Shalea Morissette, who is the Chief of Minority Business and Workforce Division for the Office of Energy Justice and Equity for the U.S. Department of Energy. Really long title. It is a really long title, and it's like it's the U.S. government. Shouldn't it just be an anagram? Shouldn't it be like blah 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 blah? <laughs> you know, just a bunch of letters crammed together. Like, make your life easier. Yeah, it's usually just chief, but some people say, "Well, what are you the chief of?" Because chief they're different chiefs. So right, right, yes. yeah. So for sure. So U.S. Department of Energy. So this is like a superstar uh, government contracting office that every government contract anybody who dreams of government contracting, like, how do I do business with them? And um, I know you're no longer in that area of the, the, the you have areas, uh, people for that. I know you're sort of in a cooler spot, in my opinion, um, which we'll talk about. But before we jump into that, tell us about yourself a little bit. Yeah, most people say, you know, how did you get here? So I came from the world of utilities. So I come from the world of natural gas. And prior to that, uh, I was working in higher education. I've done all sorts of things in my career. Um, but at one point I looked around and I was like, I need something stable and energy was where it was at. And so I went to a career fair um, and it turned and morphed into what it is today of getting a call and saying, hey, I think we have something for you. Are you interested? You should apply. Uh, and, and so I did. And at one point in this wonderful journey, I started doing so much nonprofit work that I got a second job. So I was actually working for the utility company and I was teaching 11th and 12th graders um, a curriculum that I helped write, which was engineering with energy in mind, sort of getting young people to understand the correlation between engineering and all of the energy around you. So it was really fun. Uh, and so I finished up with my students and I started working for the department. And in the last year, I have been all over the country to 23 different states, wow. visiting and giving talks and telling people basically where the money is as it relates to Bill and IRA. And forgive me in advance for using lovely acronyms because it is alphabet soup in the government. True story. <laughs> True story. Yeah. True yes. story. So, I mean, I, I and you know, I, I have your contact information because we worked uh, on some government contracting stuff and it was probably, I'm not sure where, if it was in, I don't think it was Huntsville, the Huntsville, I think it might have been in either Virginia or Baltimore where we, we, we met each other uh, many years ago, pre-pandemic. Mm -hmm. um so it's really cool to hook up with you and be able to talk to you uh in this brand that we have um but you know before we jump into the whole department of energy and what you do um briefly tell me about this book you're writing oh my gosh so i'm, I'm doing the book because what i find is everybody is curious about the dollars but they're always curious about me. I have a tendency to not share about myself. I think I've only done it one time in the last year and a half in this job uh, and share about my story and what it's like to be with a mom that the first time she ever had sex, she got me to lose my dad at seven in an incredible uh, murder story and to be the first person in my family to have a master's degree. My mom never went back to high school and having me um, as a young person and sort of saying, you know, my mom will tell you, like you were totally switched at birth, right? So sort of telling that story of the dualities of having a mother that was functionally illiterate um, and being in very different environments and all that I've learned in these years and really the, the actionable steps, right? To go through something like, um, pretty extreme in your environments and being able to recover and actually thrive in that world um, is important to sort of put down. So that is what I'm doing. I, it will be um, sort of 10 steps to what to do in loss, what to do. And, and when I say loss, uh, for me, it was loss of a parent, loss of guidance, uh, loss of money, right? Sort of the setbacks that we've seen uh, in real life. Because sometimes we talk about it in such a high level that we don't give real life examples with the details of how did you recover from the thing and we also have a tendency to talk about our successes without examining the failures in full with full transparency 
So that's that's a little bit of the book, right? Yeah, um, it is. It is. It's it's definitely. I mean, you know, I think there's a lot of rate relatability in the entrepreneurial sphere for people who. Um, you know, and and again, I don't, this is definitely an interview I want to have with you later on to have this conversation because I have my own my own backstory, you know, yeah. and it's 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 getting out of the survivor mindset because that's a bad place to be to stay in, um, and I think that's what happens with a lot of entrepreneurs they get out of that survivor mode and start to move into those success spaces. But we're gonna have this conversation further um, because that's a whole episode in and of itself. Yeah, to for talk sure. about um so you know you, now you put yourself through college or was this oh something, yeah yeah this was yeah all mom you, was right? not giving up all her socials to the federal government not gonna happen it was figure it out kid i don't know how to help you right so um as much as she wanted to be supportive she didn't know how so did my undergrad in business uh bounced around to a couple schools but i ended up finishing at georgia Gwinnett college very proud of that. Uh, went on to get my master's from Cambridge College. I am working on a third degree in nuclear engineering tech at Excelsior University. Um, well, Excelsior College. Um, so it's it's moving. It's shaking. I don't know how I'm still um, among the living with all the responsibilities. Well, listen, when you're over at DARPA, if they need any marketing, you know who to call, right? <laughs> <laughs> for sure. For sure. Yes. So, um, yeah. I would say, you know, between your personal experiences, which you, you, you've shared, um, and then, you know, your education and your work history, I mean, there's probably no one better qualified to do what you do uh, at the Department of Energy than help people understand the grant process through the DOA or through the different, and again, I don't know every agency that this goes through. And I am, you know, that's what I wanted to talk to you about today was, you know, we often have people come on the show, tell us their journey, which you will do. Um, we're starting to talk to a lot more resource partners as well. Um, but, you know, this is one mystery for a lot of people is this grant process, you know, um, and not everybody's qualified, but they can become qualified. So I think, you know, if you don't mind, let's uh, drag you down that rabbit hole. Let's talk oh, about yeah. the Department of Energy and what you do over there as far as the grants are concerned and who they're for. Yeah, yeah. So grants are interesting. So so let me be clear. Grants are not for everybody to just jump in. If you are a brand new business and you are just starting up, um, please, if you're going to pursue grants, go at your local level first, right? Because the idea here is that I want you to be successful. And when you sort of, I don't want to call it screw up, but hey, sometimes you screw up. You get a contract, you didn't bid it right, right? Like you go after a grant and you say, oh, I can do all these things. And you don't realize that you've made no money. You've actually lost money just trying to win the grant. So number one, don't lose going after any of these grants. Start small, start local, build up to your state, then go after federal. It's a big game. There's more competition. Uh, and there's just a lot of money to win or lose, right? And when you're dealing with the feds, the same way at the local level, you can go to jail if you misuse federal dollars. So it's a huge risk. Uh, and so I always want to just make sure I'm as crystal clear as possible about this. So Department of Energy, we are the second largest agency in terms of money, in terms of employees. We have oh, 14,000 direct employees. We have 25,000 researchers. We probably contribute the most um, to research and science and all that good stuff. We've got 95,000 management uh, and operating contractors. So you're talking about committed last year at the end in maybe September, we had 48 billion dollars committed to our budget right um we still have another 161 billion dollars to spend okay and that's not even projecting out the next couple of years that's like two years that we've got to spend that money um in addition to that last year we released 511 new grants that was 3.9 billion dollars or so just in grants. And so let me help people understand if you don't know, a grant is not necessarily something that you pay back, right? The federal government is saying, hey, we think that it is a benefit to community to do this thing, or it's a benefit to the nation for you to execute this thing. If you can do this, let us know, put in your proposal. We will be the judge and jury and say, yes, we think you've got what it takes to do it. We issue the funds, you execute. 
On a contract side, uh, we've done about $37 billion. Um, for new contracts, it was about 1,400 brand new fresh contracts never been released before, but we also had over 7,300 contracts on the books. So there was a lot of money flowing over the last year. That's just one year, okay? So things that uh, you should know when you're thinking about federal dollars right now in this sort of moment in time, there are four big offices that I have a tendency to lean on because they have the most money. Out of the bill in IRA legislation, you have some new offices that were stood up. You have OSED. Yes, I'm going to clear up the acronym. So OSED is O-C-E-D. That's the Office of Clean Energy Demonstration. They have a budget of about $25 billion. Then you have MESC, which is the Manufacturing Energy Supply Chain Office. They have a budget of $17 billion. And then you have the uh, State and Community Energy Programs Office. That has a budget of $18 billion as well. If you're familiar with this sort of lingo that I'm talking in office names, they absorbed what we called the weatherization program. So that's for your homeowners where you're saying, hey, I need new windows, I need some HVAC, and there are state programs that fund that. That is our money. It lives in the State Community Energy Programs Office. And then there's the Loan Program Office. The Loan Program Office is responsible for making Tesla what Tesla is today. We gave them a massive loan of over $500 million. They have paid it back in full, not to worry. Um, so that money is there, but it's still available. They have billions of dollars that they are able to loan not to a small business. The uh, loan threshold, they really don't see anything lower than $100 million. And their average loan is about a billion dollars. And they have four separate programs. We can talk about each of them, right? But it's a lot. So I'm just giving you sort of overarching yeah. four big programs, right? My little office, the Office of Energy, Justice, and Equity is really responsible for sort of being the customer service to the entire department, right? So this okay. massive entity is serving this entire group to say, if you are looking to help minorities or you need advisement, we are here. We advise the Secretary of Energy um, directly to let her know, hey, what's happening in this, this particular way in this lane? Um, and we tell her how things that she makes decisions on are going to impact um, this population. Right. So that's sort of our primary function. I myself have a team of 10. Uh, they're really diverse. They have backgrounds of all different kinds. Some went to Yale. Some are um, former Marine, former Army, former Air Force. Some have worked for the Navy, just just a wide range so that we are able to really provide the technical assistance necessary to all different walks of life in the small business world. Right. So last year I was in 23 states. We have a big partnership with the Minority B Business Development Agency. We work very closely with them. If you haven't heard of them, they are the only federal agency dedicated to minorities in the federal family. And that's that's uh, Ron Uba's office, right? There you go. Right, Ron Uba, and that's out of the Department of Commerce. They run the it. Department of Commerce. Okay. Yes. So connecting the dots, we signed a big old MOU because I said, how in the world am I going to find these businesses? Yeah, I could put out a, an ad in a newspaper and, and maybe somebody would read it. Truthfully, I needed another arm to sort of help us out with this. I know everyone thinks that we have all these magic things behind the curtain and we know where all the data is. We don't. I don't have magical software to help me uh, find every single minority business in the country. It doesn't exist, I hate to tell you. You may have a slice of it, I've heard of it, fine. It's very difficult to get a master list, right? So I had to go out and find these folks. So I, mm -hmm. I've done, a billion things to try to find folks and i have we've done a good job we've got probably a roster of over ten thousand businesses that happen to be minority owned it was a lot of work included me never being home uh with my daughter or my husband so it's kind of a thing um but <laughs> we're still we're still working on it we're still traveling so what you need to know what you see on television you're gonna see like oh another 62 billion dollars through the um bipartisan infrastructure law that's what we call bill right that number has surged to over a hundred million, right? hundred billion, excuse me, billion with a B for those that are able to listen and not see this. Um, that money is wrapped up in grants. Very, very little of that money is actually for contracts. So thinking that through, that means we are saying 
these dollars should benefit community, should benefit the nation, right? Not just servicing our buildings, not saying you're going to provide security for us as an entity. No, we want to deploy these dollars in community. So you'll see other things out there saying, okay, we've got $3.1 billion to lower your energy bill. That's going to come through your state community energy programs office. You have to go to the states to get some of this money, right? We are not capable in our capacity to deliver every dollar directly to community. So we use state entities to help us spend this money. And so there are some grants that businesses are not eligible for. We right. can't give it to you. States get it. And then you apply to the states. A big example of this is everybody saying, how are we going to move to electric vehicles? Well, we've deployed billions of dollars across the nation to every state. Every state has a plan. They submitted it to us. We signed off and we said, yes, we like it. So the next five years, we're at four years now, we will deploy money year over year. You will have to go to your state to become a contractor to install all of these electric charging stations. So within 50 miles of each other, you're going to see a charging station, right? So we will then have the infrastructure to have electric vehicles. So as much as we think it's not coming, I cannot imagine that we will spend all this money, do all this installations, and then magically we'll go back to gas vehicles. I don't think that will happen. I don't have a crystal ball. Anybody can argue with me. I'm fine with that. I'm not really interested in arguing. I'm just telling you, this is what we've done and you need to be aware of it. Every, so, go ahead. So just, yeah, cause I wanna, I, I wanna reel it back just a tiny bit. Cause there's yep. a couple of key things that, uh, so, just for clarity's sake, so if I, and, and this is sort of a twofold question, mm -hmm. um, if I'm like, hey, I want to install, I want, I have an idea to put uh, wind power on every roof of every home in America, and I'm going to present this to you, and it's going to be a co-gen deal, and every home in America is going to have a, a, a windmill, right? And I'm just Eric, Yeah. right? Eric whatever i just bring my team together all these engineers we spend whatever dollars we have to spend to build the proposal and we submit it to you there's no guarantee that you're going to be signing on board to sign in to, on this right that's right. just number one but we know that that's what you get you get ideas that mm -hmm. you will get approved so that you guys approve and then you you send that money just like you said to the state yeah right so now we're talking about a tier here. We're talking about here's this. Here's you who's sending this money to each state. Each state has its plan. Yeah. Now this the state itself is is setting up contracts to primes. Yes. You know what I mean. And a lot of times they're already vetted primes on contracts that big, right? Yeah. But this is where the opportunity for the small business really kicks in because yes. here's all this infrastructure being built and. I forget what it, how many towns New Jersey alone has. I had the number somewhere. It's absurd, oh, yeah. right? And we're just a tiny state, right? And so now here's here's we have the state, and then we have the counties, and then we have the cities. So there's all this opportunity. Mm -hmm. Not just it's not a trickle down. It's literally pouring down. Yes. And but the thing is, is these contractors, these small businesses, have to get involved with their SBDCs and their SBAs and their MBDAs and everybody, and understand the process of getting their hands on that grant money yes. that you have listed in your programs publicly on your website. So it's not a fantasy that it exists or it's not happening. Am I right? Am I wrong? You're absolutely right. And I want people to understand. When you think about electric charging stations as an example of something that we really do have out in the world, it's not just the electric charging stations that we're paying for. The plan that was submitted includes or may not include, depending on the state, hey, we're going to need dollars for safety. So, so those flaggers that are out there, somebody has to pay them. That's going to be part of the contract. So those barricades that are up to keep people safe, somebody's got to install them and remove them. That's your opportunity. It's not just the people making the installations. There's also the level of who's going to maintain these things. Right. So even if you are not installing them, we are building an ecosystem that has a lot of maintenance to it. And let's be honest, with technology, five, ten years from now, we're going to replace it all. Right. Like, like speak, nothing lasts that long. There will be innovation over innovation. And some cities and towns will say, no, we want the latest and greatest. We've got the tax for it. We can do that. Or there may be a wave again from us, depending on what happens um, in the administration and, and all of the dollars that we have flowing. 
there'll be another opportunity because we will have to upgrade. We will have to maintain this system that we're building. There'll be things like security. Think about why the electric vehicle is not booming. Women are not buying electric vehicles. Why? Because you are a sitting duck. When you are charging your vehicle for an hour and there's no security and you're not in the best of neighborhoods where you know crime is high, you're not willing to take the risk with your child in the backseat to charge a vehicle for 45 minutes. So no, they're not buying them in abundance because we don't have it set up yet. So there will be areas that you can engage as a small business um, to sort of level up. Taking mm -hmm. on a government contract can put you in the upper echelon of millions of dollars uh, in revenue and profitability. So opportunity is there, but you have to engage now and be sort of in a space of knowing that I do a thing. Let me adjust to what is happening around me because the energy movement, at least to clean energy in a lot of different areas, is going to happen whether you want to engage or not. Yeah. It's happening, right? Yeah. So change, change is inevitable. It always has been. Look at us. We're in AI now. And, you know, there you go. We're, you know. we're in it. We're in it. So that's one example. So you got state community energy programs. It deploys to the states. It trickles down water flowing right now. Right. Tap in. Just do me one solid for the businesses that are listening, watching. Don't just ask for the contract. That's really not how it works. It's actually illegal. Right. I'm sure most of you know this, but I need to say it for the newbies of you can't say, hey, I'm qualified. Give me the contract. It's not how it works, guys. And I have people do it all the time. People will come to me and say, mm. well, I'm large enough. Just give me the contract and then I will funnel it out to all of your little minority businesses. I've had people say it to me. Mm. I've, I've seen it. And, you know, I think the sentiment was we can help people because we are pretty much risk averse because we've done it before. The reality is I can't give you a contract right? No, no. It doesn't matter who you know. I have learned in the last year and a half, there is red tape on purpose. There, I know plenty of people in business and they've said, how do I get a contract? You got to go through the process. It is no different. I don't care that you're a minority business. I don't care that you're a small business. The reality is there is a process. It's there for a reason. It's there so that people don't take advantage of their position, right? So please, for, for those of you listening, respect the process because we are trying to protect your tax dollars. Every dollar we spend, we are trying to mitigate risk. We don't want any company to take your money and fail because that right. costs money, right? Well, like well historically, like I, I think what was one of the big ones, like the big scam, like Enron way back in the yes. day. Remember Enron was like yes. all scammy. Um, so yeah, no, it makes sense. And I think small businesses... Um, and, and and again, I think for the most part, a lot of small businesses, you know, are aware that there is a bid process, there is a, a a protocol, and you know, and one of the things we are we realize and we understand is that a lot of small businesses don't realize there's resources. They don't realize that they can go, let's say, to the your your website, look at something, and then maybe you don't have the office that's teaching them how to be a small business and a, and a competitive bidder. But you're not you're not just gonna blow them off. No, you're gonna be not. like, did you talk? Here's the link to the SBDC or your local yes. what is it, Apex Accelerator? Yes. It used to be PTAC. Um, or you're gonna guide them because every you know, we have A, what is the Buy American Act, right? That's yeah. number number one. Number two is I think what's the percentage? It's like ninety something like eighty or ninety percent of all agencies are are, are, are well, of every age, we're supposed to be buying 80 or 90 percent of goods from small business. Yes. And you know? domestic. Right. Domestic. Right. So so there's a lot of goal setting that we do as different agencies. We say we know what we can and can't do. Keep in mind that for the Department of Energy, a third of our budget is dedicated to nuclear weapons. Not a lot of companies can do that kind of work. Right. So we right. are uh, we do have sort of a, a, a slice of our big pie that is set aside. You know, I can't give a janitorial company a contract to break down nuclear weapons. That's just the reality, right? I know it sounds like a no-brainer, but you'd be surprised um, the level of clearances you need for what you're exposed to. Even coming into our building, if you come to Washington, D.C., um, you will be met with ARs and, and full-on security. It's a federal building, right? right. Um, and that can be jarring to people. So if you ever get a meeting to come in and meet me or anybody else, just know that it is tight security because we have 
we have weapons. I don't know what to tell you, right? That's the nice way to say it. Uh, be prepared for full security check, all the good stuff. Um, it's just, it's just sort of the truth of it. So um, we, we do have some other areas that I think small businesses that are thinking ahead about innovation. So we release a list of topics twice a year. It's called the SBIR program. I, I'm not sure if you've had anybody on the show to talk about it, but I will because ours is special. Um, so okay. <laughs> twice a year, we release a list of topics and they are problems, right? They, they truly are hey, we know, meaning the department, we know that every second of every day, a solar panel ends up in a landfill. We know that we need a solution. So if you as a business, as an inventor, as a higher education institution, you can actually say, hey, I think I might have something and you can participate in this opportunity. The beautiful part about it is this is the only set of funds that I've identified. And again, guys, I'm a year and a half in, right? I'm learning the federal government and it's a mammoth. Um, that these dollars are non-dilutable, meaning you get to keep your idea. We may not be your end customer. It's yours to keep. The goal with this particular program is to get you to commercialization. We're trying to make you competitive. It's a direct investment in your R&D and getting you there. So the first wave of funding is anywhere from $200,000 to $250,000. Twice a year, 400 awards is is our cap. This is just with my agency. This is just with the Department of Energy. There are 11 out of the 16 in the federal family that have the same program. Same thing, different set of topics. So DOT is releasing things on transportation, railroads, all of that good stuff. We're doing it around energy and it might be something crazy. It might be, hey, could you extend an x-ray wave, right? Okay, I don't know how to do that, but somebody might. Uh, but it's also like, hey, could you repurpose, reuse a solar panel? We're not talking about for you know office furniture. We're talking about really reuse it for its original intended purpose. Um, if you can use super capacitors, whatever that looks like. The second wave, so after a year, so you get the 250,000, you come back and you say, look, I think I've got it, but I need more money. No problem. We'll give you 1.1 up to 1.6 million. Beautiful. Again, you don't have to give this money back. This is for you. This is for you to go figure it out. Right. So this is like the alpha, the the, the all the testing, the research development, yes. the alpha test, the beta test. This is all this process. Yes. So, and I don't want to get into the the Alice in Wonderland dream past well, that, like 1.2 million. But you'll you'll see where my question is going here. Because we're talking about this is great stuff, but there's got to be preparedness yes. and there's got to be qualifications. Yes. Right. And so, because you could say to a guy like me, hey, here's 200,000, and I'm going to be like, okay, I'm not going to say no, even though I'm not qualified. <laughs> I'm not going to say no, I'm taking the money. Right. Um, so there's, and, and there is preparedness, there is qualifications that, you know, this is not a startup with somebody who just has an idea who said, oh, wait a minute, I make office furniture. Right. Right. Yeah. So, so let me give you, let me give you, it is an idea that is novel. Okay. Right. But you okay. want to have a solid work plan to prove its feasibility. Like you got to think about it, make it make sense because these are still dollars that we are uh, investing to a certain degree. We don't want the money back, but it is an investment and we do want you to be successful. So your team needs to be composed of the right expertise. If you have a business degree and you are asking to do nuclear fission, <laughs> there is no, right? So make it make sense. Um, that'll probably be my mantra for the rest of this episode, right? It's, great um, one. <laughs> it's also, um, it must be technology development R&D. That's what we are looking for. We are looking for technology that can solve an issue and we will give you the money for your R&D, okay? Um, the other side is you have to show in, in your articulation, in your writing, that there is potential impact for this R&D. What will it do? Whether it will make you number one in the nation, what, what will your success look like? What are we investing in? That's really the crux of this. Um, it's a grant, it's not a contract, it's your idea, it's your execution, know that. Um, the funded ideas that are too high risk for the private sector is what we take on, right? Uh, so that that can be really helpful for the person that's, you know, maybe working for the utility company for the last 20 years and then says, I do this every day. I have a solution and they have a problem that I look at on a daily basis. It can be that. It can be an individual, uh, but it does require you thinking that through. We do require a um, 
a letter of intent first. So we don't let you spin your wheels and, and waste your time. You submit a letter of intent to say, this is what I'm thinking. These are my qualifications. This is what it could look like. And we say, yes, we like that. Move on to the next stage. And then you build it out and you tell us what you're going to do if you receive that money, right? By the end of this, because this is a four wave program, you can get just under $6 million all grant dollars. So it truly could get you to commercialization. Um, people that have won this, uh, Dr. Lonnie Johnson, the inventor of the super soaker, he's won it for other ideas. And the seed money does go a long way. So that's why I say it is plausible. Uh, the one big difference for Department of Energy compared to other agencies, uh, as far as I know, no one else has it. We have what's called a phase zero program. It's a free program for newbies, fresh out of the box. You've never done it before. We don't have a record of you ever applying for this SBIR program. Small Business Innovation Research is what the program is known as. Small Business Innovation Research. Just, I know that's long, but we call it SBIR or SIBR if you wanna sound fancy when you're talking to folks. Um, essentially, it's a 12 week program. Uh, you get access to things like your patent attorney, 10 hours with a market researcher. We will um, provide you with travel assistance if you need to go and talk to a subject matter expert, um, if you need like verification on something. So we give you those sorts of things and we will help you write that letter of intent to get you started. Um, so we make it make sense for you as a first timer. So it's a really solid program. Look at it. It comes out twice a year for us. Uh, other agencies, it comes out sometimes on a rolling basis. But Google, SBIR, federal government, everything you need to know will come up. Read, read, read. There's a lot of information. Right. Up. Please read. Um, so that's top of mind. I need so much more. Um, yeah, there is a ton, and we're running out of time. Yeah. Um, but I am going to make a note here to say, you know, the SBI are our program. We hear of it through uh, local, through the state SBDC offices. They're running programs like that. Um, I know, uh, you know, through the Veterans Business Outreach Centers, they're promoting the SBIRR. I mean, tech and research, it's a, the, the technological advancements are huge. So we, we, the, the steam engine is pretty much a dead issue. Um, you know, we're, we're on to other, other innovations. And so there's a lot of support for that, but, um, I'm going to have the website down at the bottom of the screen when we, when we edit this, you know, put all the pretty stuff on it. But do you want to say where people need to go to find out information? Oh, I mean, if you visit energy.gov, right, that's going to be the rabbit hole that everybody goes down and you will find, uh, like I said, the mammoth that is department of energy. You can always go to grants.gov. One of the websites I think that we didn't get to in this is herox.com. Mm -hmm. um, it is a website where you can actually compete. So for my small businesses, if you want to not have to write a proposal that is 25 pages long on your first time out, um, it is herox, so H-E-R-O-X.com forward slash American dash made dash challenges, challenges with an S. Right now we have eight active challenges. The difference here is that the dollar threshold is lower. However, mm -hmm. your submission is much more attainable. You're talking about a 90 second video for some of these submissions. So you get mm -hmm. to be creative. You get to submit a slide deck instead of 25 pages, right? Mm -hmm. uh, some of this stuff doesn't even require heavy financials. Right now we have an opportunity out called um, Rex Before Recycling Prize. We are looking for people to actually um, get things before they go into the recycling process and reuse them, repurpose them. Um, and in that pot, I think we have uh, $5.6 million. So think about different pieces of energy that we can stop from ending up in the recycling process uh, and actually get manufacturers to reuse it. We have community driven prizes uh, there around community energy innovation. We've got some cool stuff in powering sea and supporting um, sort of the blue economy. Offshore wind, of course, is a thing, but we need more innovation. There's tremendous amount mm. to, um, sort of step into in that world. So tons and tons of opportunities. Wow. See, this is and this is what, what we don't know about to be honest with you, like this is not, this is not being advertised during the middle of the Super Bowl. You know what I mean? Like, but I will be there. I will be doing some stuff at, at Super Bowl. 
Um, if you're a business owner, I'll be in the back with SBA with a booth and, and doing all the stuff to tell people about what we have. So see, okay, fantastic, fantastic. Yeah. So um we're gonna um wrap it up here. Uh I'm gonna keep you on for a minute after we stop recording, but I wanted to thank you uh for coming on. Shalaya Morissette, the chief of minority business and workforce division for the Office of Energy Justice and Equity for the US Department of Energy. So I'm just going to say the, the the boss of the U.S. Department of Energy. I can say it. They can't get mad at you. <laughs> um, and I thank you for being on. We are definitely going to uh, be reconnecting with you. I'm thinking we're going to have to do two more episodes with you because um, there's so much information. Um, obviously, we want to talk about the book on the next time and, and your entrepreneurial journey. Uh, but uh, I want to thank you for coming on and trusting that, you know, we we we're doing we're out there trying to get this information out absolutely keep up the good work well thank you so much thank you bye